Darkfire Audio presents Brood of Bones, written by A. E. Marling, narrated by Henrietta Meir. Chapter 1. Caged I never learned the knack for waking. Consciousness hung over me like a sodden rag weighing on my eyelids and muffling my ears, yet even my stifled senses did not spare me the indignity of hearing my name screamed across a public place. Horatia! The reckless shout could not refer to me, I decided. Another lady of the same name must peruse the bazaar, someone who would consider replying to the immodesty of a raised voice. Why, I was not even in view but safe behind curtains. Regardless, I trembled in the dimness, my head ringing with remembered shouts. Horatia walks like a sleepy monkey. Horatia, you're slower than a drunken sloth. And how could she ever raise children? Horatia sleeps more than a newborn. My neck burned and flushed under layers of silk and velvet. Gowns that had comforted me in the frigid climate of the academy now smothered, and I began to pant, sweat running down my back like a millipede with a thousand tickling feet. I had to disperse the heat building inside me, though deep breaths only drew in more hot air. My lungs smouldered and my chest refused to move altogether when the worst happened. A woman screamed my name again. Horatia, don't leave me to die! My drowsiness ground against a heat headache, and I could make no sense of the shout. The disjointed words tumbled in my mind, holding no meaning either together or alone. The carriage in which I was riding slowed to a standstill. A door opened spilling light over the drifts and folds of my gowns. Jewels covered the landscape of fabric that draped over the seats, and the interior of my carriage glittered like a geode. My maid bustled within and unhooked my arms from their harnesses of silk. The crisscross of cloth was used to hold me upright while travelling, to prevent me from falling forward in my sleep and hurting myself. I asked, "'Why ever has Deepman stopped the carriage?' Couldn't say, made Janny tugged on my gloves. Maybe hereabouts women cry for the enchantresses to save them for every hour. On the hour. Must amount to a proper nuisance. I hardly think the woman meant me. Only three, the flawless, is expecting my arrival. Might be she recognised something about your carriage. It's four white horses or the eye-blistering golden wheels. Janny dabbed the sweat on my brow, then scuttled out again. May Janny inform Deepman to... May Janny! The carriage tipped and bobbed as spell-sword Deepman descended from the driver's perch. His turban glinted with gold thread and his eyes shone black as onyx above a long beard neatly trimmed into a rectangle. He lifted an embossed gauntlet to assist my step down to the road, yet I only sat and wondered what this was all about and who had screamed. The person in question had taken great liberties with my name. I peered out across the bazaar of fallen stars, with merchant tents, open chests twinkled with diamonds, rugs spread with vials of perfume, a fire-breather performed with an orange flash and a crowd gathered around a cage for the unjust. Hirisha! The woman's cry seemed to originate from the cage. He'll kill me tonight! She seems rather excessive. I knew something of the severity of crimes punished by time in the cage, and I never went out of my way to meet murderers. Spellsword Deepmond, I have an appointment with Shri the Flawless at the God's Eye Court. You may take me there now. May I take leave to suggest, he said that the delay will be worthwhile, Elder Enchantress. Hearing him use my title in public reassured me. I was not so very old, yet being called Elder added another comforting layer of concealment. Both my driver and my personal guard, Spellsword Deepmond, possessed a wealth of alertness. I trusted him with my safety and my dignity, and if he thought I should associate myself with this outburst, then I would. Taking his hand, I dragged myself from my seat. 
Sweeps of cloth flowed after me, my gown spreading from the confines of the carriage in a sparkling cascade. The crowd gasped, and my spine tightened while sickness at my own inadequacy wormed its way up my intestines. I was floored, and they would see it. They would shout it like they always had. Look, the girl who fell asleep in the privy! The taunt boomed in my mind. Thought she'd died in there, and when we had the door broken, we all seen her with her skirt pulled up. Remember her face? Blinking awake, then gape-eyed like she was choking. Heat billowed from my heart, scalding my chest and rushing to my head. The world blurred and rolled about me. I could not focus on any of the bodies in the crowd, only their staring faces. They were a multi-headed beast, a hydra ready to devour. Her own mother introduced her as an idiot, said a cobra had spat in her ear, rotted her brain. I walked with an ornate cane. To be precise, I stumbled forward, and the cane saved me from falling in a heap of silk before the monstrous throng of eyes. A brick cracked under Deepman's plated boot, and the isolated noise forced me to realise that the bazaar was hushed. None of the people had spoken, none had jeered. For the first time I focused on an individual, a woman with a pink cloth wrapped around her belly's enviable roundness. Her short blue blouse would not by itself have covered her pregnancy, and her healthy skin was the hue of amber and lustrous from budding motherhood. My gowns had tricked her, and the rest into not recognising me. I reminded myself that these people were the virtuous citizens of Morimand, and years had passed since any had seen the girl who had fallen asleep in the street privy. The same weight of sleep bowed me over now, and I teetered forward, feeling in my plethora of gowns that I waded through a river of silk. I slipped, the cane catching me at the last moment. No one in the predominantly male crowd seemed to notice, although my searching eyes caught on another pregnant woman. This one propped a toddler on top of her enlarged belly, leaning far back to compensate for the weight. She had a wilted look, and when she sneezed I feared she would collapse. Her nose ran, eyes a red and blotchy shade of someone who had not slept well for a year. Meeting expectant women was always bittersweet. Half smiling and half wincing, I approached her while she held her gaze lowered. I did not imagine this demure person had been the one to call for my help, yet I reached up into the blue and green ribbons of my headdress to remove a jewelled brooch which I handed to her. Sell this, I said, and buy yourself some help and a few days rest. She began to sob, staring down at the cluster of emeralds and gold in her hand, and I shared a moment of surprise. I had meant to give her a topaz brooch, and instead had presented a treasure worthy of a princess. Yet I would not think of taking back the gift. At the sight of my charity, the crowd surged closer. Spellsword Deepmand stopped the tide with single upraised gauntlet. He resembled a gold and bronze-plated armadillo, except with a scimitar clamped to his back, large enough to decapitate an elephant. I looked towards my destination, the cage, only to be accosted by the appearance in the crowd of a third woman flaunting her fertile belly, The coincidence of seeing three pregnant women in a row shocked me like the sharp pain from a biting fly. After my next step swayed towards the cage, a voice of an older woman issued from within the bars. Bless you, Hiresha. Perhaps only one god has cursed me. Blinking away my fatigue, I saw an elderly matron entrapped within the cage, her fat belly pressed against the slats of brass, She must have been the source of the screams. My lethargic thoughts thrashed about trying to recall where I had seen her wrinkled face before. I am Shri, she said in response to my confusion. This is who I now am. Shri the Flawless? As soon as I said it, I regretted it. The Flawless could not be in shackles. I always had respected Shri as the city's arbiter and a woman of sober thinking and propriety, and no possibility existed that she could be locked in this cage, a death sentence fit for rapists and cannibals. The bars would trap her outside at night, exposing her to feasters. Those locked in the cage could not run, nor would bars protect them. An indirect method of execution... 
The open-air prison dragged out death over hours or days. Yet all knew it better to satisfy the feasters with criminals than leave them to bang on the doors of the innocent at midnight. This woman already looked half dead, perhaps even three-quarters so. Jaundice discoloured her eyes and sleeplessness ringed them, while her white hair contrasted with her sickly yellow skin. The more I peered at her, however, the more I thought I recognised her as Shri the Flawless. An even more unbelievable possibility presented itself. Entertaining this second idea, I concluded, testified to how sleepiness warped my thinking and how my mindset distorted perception. Shri the Flawless, the chaste arbiter of the city and four decades my senior, appeared to be not merely fat, but pregnant.